Hi, I'm Ian Mean. I'm Director of Business West in Gloucestershire. On Thursday 1st of June, SGS College, in partnership with Business West, hosted a forum at the SGS Berkeley Green Campus to discuss how to bridge the science, technology, engineering and maths, STEM, skills gaps within the Gloucestershire region. Panel members included Roman Cooper, small business champion for G First LEP, Peter Carr, Gloucestershire County Council as the League Commissioner for Employment and Skills, Kevin Hamblin, SGS Group Chief Executive, and Lucy Ackland, Senior Development Engineer at Renishaw PLC. From the panel discussion, 30 key points were identified, highlighting the breadth of the challenges the region faces and the need to continue working collaboratively to address these. Next steps will include reaching consensus agreement on the challenges that exist within the region, building on the work of Gloucestershire County Council, G First LEP, SGS College, Business West and other key stakeholders are undertaking in getting commitments from all key players to address the issues and deliver a skills manifesto for Gloucestershire. With this in mind, please take the time to listen to the panel discussion in detail. Also, a date for the diary. To hear more is Business West Breakfast event at SGS Barclay Green on Friday 29 September. Please contact either myself at ian.mean at businesswest.co.uk or Liam Evans at liam.evans at sgscold.ac.uk should you want more details or to reserve a place. started apprenticeship rewards here in Gloucestershire um, and that's now spread throughout the country and um, we've got some good people here and I want very very quickly to talk to them um, and then give you the chance to ask, ask them questions. My whole bag really in Business West is that I believe that skills is probably the key issue in this county. There are two things, I'd say skills and housing, affordable housing. And they both go hand in glove, they really do. Uh, I'm actually blown away by this place. I mean, for those of you who know the history of Barclay, it was incredibly innovative in the 60s. Uh, you've only got to look around here, and I think you can see it's equally innovative now. And I'd like to ask Kevin to come up and talk just briefly about the real strategy here, because this isn't a college, it isn't a school, it's a hybrid, I think. It's something that's very, very different. And I think it's, it really is the future. And what we need is more people like you to come and actually see it. Uh, I have to say as an editor, i would not been to Barclay until uh, a few months ago. And I guess a lot of people haven't. So it's great that you're here. So Kevin, can you just join us? And what I want to ask you really is the vision for this site. As I say, it's not a school, it's not a college. 
It's something very, very different. Yeah. Well, about five years ago, um, Tilton College, I used to be principal at Tilton College, and Stroud College um, uh, merged. Um, it was something that uh, there was a cut in funding, we wanted to get larger, and we wanted to get the economies of scale. And part of that merger was to protect the vocation provision in, in the Stroud district and Gloucestershire as a uh, county. The concern was Stroud was too small as a college, and that if um, it was any smaller, because there's uh, declining demographics, then it would probably close. And if it closed, there would be the vocational provision in this, in the south of the county, that they uh, would be if it stayed open. Part of that was uh, there was a ring fence, £600,000 for engineering facilities somewhere in the Stroud district. That was the, um, uh, uh, the promise at uh, merger. And um, we looked at Dursley and we, we looked at doing something in engineering. But at the same time, I was starting hearing um, employers say, look, colleges aren't responding. There is a skills um, a need. It's probably at middle management level. It's experience. But in order to get there, we've got to get this demand up. So more young people choose to go in the um, engineering manufacturing so that um, it feeds the growth in Gloucestershire. And it was a big uh, risk about um, uh, uh, three or four years ago. I uh, spoke with uh, uh, Neil Carmichael and um, other um, uh, people. And so look, I'm looking for the, uh, a side, so look at Barclay. And um, so at the time, we've got very little money, but at the time we said, okay, we'll, we'll do something at Barclay because four miles away is Oldbury. And I hope that Oldbury was going to take off and we would have to develop some training and um, we'd be ideally placed to, to, um, uh, to grow with that, um, uh, that particular demand. From that point, uh, we've managed to leverage in with um, uh, the LEP um, and growth funding, uh, the UTC, about £30 million worth of capital funding. It's quite unique that Gloucestershire, the size of Gloucestershire, has got this massive uh, uh, investment in it. So, uh, it reminds me of Ron Pickering, uh, uh, those that are old enough to remember Ron Pickering. He said um, uh, quite clearly, you'll never find a pole vaulter where there's no pole vaulting pit. And, um, and it's always stuck with me that has, and he said, if you don't have the facilities for engineering and manufacturing, you won't educate uh, engineers and, and uh, um, uh, young people to go into uh, to manufacturing. So that was the base, uh, base of it. And so what we're doing is, we're really at the start of the journey. By September, we would have uh, completed the top half of this, um, of this site. Um, everything that we've done here has been in response to what we've heard from the employers. What we um, uh, are seeing now is employers are now stepping up to the plate and saying, OK, I get it. You've done your bit. What we've got to do now is uh, make sure that young people um, uh, actively choose to go into science, technology, engineering, and um, uh, maths, so that the demand uh, rises in this place gets a, a buzz about it. So um, uh, what we're doing is uh, uh, sitting over 30 million pounds. There's loads of stuff that I could talk about that's coming down the tra uh, uh, train track, but um, uh, for today, um, it's just the start of the journey. Okay, um, how are you going to get parents to really take on board the fact that their children could be interested in becoming an engineer? Well, one of the uh, big risks, and there's always risks, isn't there, with everything, but is um, uh, we uh, decided that we put a bid in for a university technical college. Anybody who's read the, read the paper say there are some UTCs, it's a, um, a conservative um, uh, um, uh, you know, initiative, um, uh, Lord uh, Baker is really driving this. He's saying, look, at 14, in Germany at 14, you can choose a vocational or technical route. But in the uh, UK, we said, no, you've got to be uh, academic until 16, and then you can choose the vocational route. By then, people want to be uh, singers, and they want to be um, uh, hairdressers, and nothing wrong with this at all. But um, what we're seeing is with the um, uh, um, uh, national curriculum, is they're being penned in, and from my perspective, 
for 50% of the population being penned into a system that doesn't allow them to do what they really want at 14. They have to be pushed down to GCSEs at uh, 16 because that is what has been fed into A-levels and, and degrees. And uh, what I'm looking forward to is a, a great emphasis on these T-levels, where the technical levels have the same parity of esteem as A-levels, so that uh, parents can say, so I'm a, a parent of five children, and it's complicated for me, I'm in the, in, you know, in the business. So goodness knows what it must be like for those that are not in the um, uh, in education. But um, uh, what we're seeing with the UTC, to answer the question is, primarily the first stab is those parents who are in, in engineering, or they're in manufacturing, or they're in the uh, technologies, they get it. They come here, they get it, and, and, um, and the young people that we've got, and at 14 is a big ask, isn't it? I'm going to leave all the mates, I'm going to uh, leave the school I've been with for, for a long time, I'm going to travel a bit further, it's going to be a longer day. Um, so we're asking them to, to pull up, uh, uh, they give up a lot, but to the person we interview, every single child, and every, um, every one of them really wants to do this. There is a demand there, but what we've got to get first is the pole vaulting pit. Get the pole vaulting pit first, <coughs> Get it um, up and running, inspire people, and then our, um, uh, you know, we don't have to sell it. But at the moment, it's a case of uh, our reputation is going some way, so people are uh, believing that we will deliver this. <coughs> and the building uh, next door is absolutely superb. Neil, I know you didn't want to be on the panel because you're a candidate in waiting, so to speak, but look, we all know you're chairman of the Education Select Committee. Is Kevin right? Best time, um, Yeah, I, I am involved in a competition. Uh, I'm not pole vaulting. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go back to the track uh, shortly. Um, it's kind of a sprint, really, but um, that's my activity in the next week, actually. Uh, Kevin is absolutely right. Um, if you were going to say, what does this country need and what does this county need in particular, you'd probably end up saying we need more people able to do the kind of skills and perform the kind of jobs that are tomorrow, not yesterday. And they are in energy, that's technology, and of course it's manufacturing. They are the things of tomorrow, and they are the things that this place is really going to thrive with, with and this place is really going to deliver on. Because Fundamentally, that is about our future, and it's about our educational future. Now, two things that Kevin has absolutely rightly emphasised. One is the interface between the worlds of education and the worlds of work, in particular business. We've got to see more synergy between those two worlds, more understanding of each other, so that young people do feel acclimatised, so to speak, to the kind of opportunities that are going to come before them. Um, the second thing is, of course, and we all know we're going to be leaving the European Union, not something I was coming We've got these facilities, they just need bums on seat. So what the NDP can do, what do you want, what do you want, you know, there's 35,000 visitors in the county, and there's about 12 or 15 people in the NDP. You know, just we go and knock on the doors and say, hi everyone, can you get yourself to it? But I think there's, we've got a set environment, and we've got a set framework, we've got a set of channels through, and this is where the, the growth hubs are, are also coming in. So go to your growth hub, the growth hubs have been uh, rolled out around the county. Go to growth hubs say, I've got a need for training or development or investment or whatever. And there'll be people there to signpost you in the right direction to people who need. I don't think there's anything more we can do because actually if you're in business, by definition, you should be dynamic and you should be looking for uh, looking for the right, right support. I think the big, the, the big thing for me, my, my friend of mine runs an engineering company in Cam. He's not engaged into any of this. Uh, he has a fantastic business, but he runs a business. And so he's saying, how do I, and, and so the challenge for the NEP is to reach out to people like him, because at this event particularly, you, we might see the same faces. You know, we see the same faces at the same events all around the county, and those people are well engaged, well connected, they know what's happening, uh, they know what the crack is. But that's a very, very small percentage of the business community. And it, the, the trick for the NEP, if we can do it, is, is to reach out into those other Sort of 25,000 businesses. I mean, we're talking about Melbourne there, it's talking, talking about engaging with 450 businesses out of 25,000. I mean, it's a tiny proportion. So, and because we're a very fragmented county. So, in terms of what the NEP can do, well, you know, from my own perspective, you know, this is a, a voluntary role. 
um, and, and the board is made up of about a dozen volunteers. Uh, and behind the scenes, as I said, there's about 10 or 12 people who, who run, run the NEP. So it's, it's an enabling organisation, and I think that they're setting the framework up for us to engage with people like uh, Kevin and his organisation <coughs> to, to drive our own business on. So if there's a lot of words, and not a lot of action, then uh, that's what it is. But we've raised 105 million quid to come into the county to be spent on projects to, to enable things to happen. So I think we are very active and are engaged in linking up education and, and uh, business. And I think that there's sort of various elements to that. I mean, I think the, uh, I'm sort of what, three, four months into, into a new role, uh, the, the kind of key focus of that is very much about bringing, bringing businesses and, and education and training even closer together. Um, and, and essentially, I think, you know, for me, there's sort of several elements to that. One is to actually have a strategic sort of link in terms of skills uh, with the skill system and businesses. So that there's a, a lot of kind of uh, individual businesses linked to, the, to uh, individual education training providers. Um, what we want to do is actually have a strategic link on that, which is actually to set up an employment skills board to actually join the two and, and sort of really feed those key messages in. Actually getting a board in place um, is kind of the easy bit, if you like. It's, it's actually what that group does. But you know, we're, we're behind the curve in, in, compared to some other areas and we haven't got a kind of a, a coordinated skills strategy across the, the county. Is, is there a big idea, though? Is there a plan? Well, the will, that, that, that group will actually develop that, that plan. So there's, there's a number of elements to that. Um, but that, that board, which will bring together both education training providers and uh, and business representatives um, to actually develop that plan. You know, a big, big part of that, I mean, Catherine Wagstaff and my colleagues in the, in the room has done an awful lot of work to actually prepare the ground for, for that group actually coming through uh, and actually get a sensible evidence base together so that that group can actually make some key strategic decisions about it. And that will then help in terms of kind of the, the, the provision that, that Kevin and the team at SGS are, are developing and, and the other colleges and schools are, are working on. What's your message to companies? Um, continue to engage, continue to, to, to work with us. I mean, it works, um, I think it, you know, that, that's at a strategic level, at an operational level, there's an awful lot going on. And again, uh, there's, uh, I know we've got. You know, Got uh, people involved uh, with with STEM works. Um, Sharon from the Children Festivals here. Um, you know, there's a number of, of links there. Um, a lot of schools really want to engage in the STEM agenda more fully, um, and uh, and there's a, there are real opportunities to do that. But there's a real sense of very little resource in the schools to enable that to happen on a day to day basis, um, and uh, and a lot of goodwill from businesses. You've got the two sides that are not quite sure how to connect in some cases, uh, and there's a there's a some work that, uh, that that the AP is doing at the moment. Uh, the education team is doing to actually link the, the two together, and, and we use the phrase decluttering the system quite a bit, which is actually um, trying to help businesses see how they can make those engagements with schools and and, and colleges, and, and equally, you know, the, the, the from the, the schools and colleges perspective. How can they engage with businesses without those business, those same businesses? I know several of you from Renishaw here, you know, continually getting those calls. Uh, I know other uh, Delphi here as well. You know, continually getting the calls because you're the first ones on the list quite often for people. But don't uh, schools have a big responsibility because it's not in their interest to, uh, for instance, with someone like Lucy here, and she'll tell you her story in a minute. Um, it's not in their interest to encourage young people, perhaps, into the STEM area. They're rated, in their view, on university places. Are they really interested in this area? Um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, I know you don't get that impression, though. Yeah. Well, okay, that's 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 a you know a matter of opinion. But I think that there are a number of uh, a number of schools who are incredibly strong in terms of their, their STEM progressions, their STEM links. Um, you know, there's a, an awful lot of work going on in, in schools. It's very easy, I think, to, to kind of knock uh, education training providers, schools, colleges. Um, for not providing kind of what's what's needed when actually the, there's an awful lot of work that is going on with that. Um, I, I think uh, from one of the slides that Pete put up, you know, you had the bloodhound um, 
uh, steam here, which for those of you who don't know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a rocket powered car. Um, so uh, basically the, uh, uh, the, the, there's a number of students actually get together and build, you know, they actually build this. It's a, it's a kind of a, a really fantastic live project. And there are a lot of schools that are doing that sort of work and bringing in that sort of activity to make it happen. And, and in addition to the, the kind of core teaching of the STEM subject, it's that sort of um, enthusiasm and excitement that's generated by that sort of project. And, and there are a lot of schools that are doing that to, to try and make that kind of more in yeah. um, When I went to Festimay, Neil's, uh, uh, Neil's fantastic. It's now what, third year? Fourth year. Um, what really surprised me is that the, the enthusiasm of kids seven, eight, nine. Haven't we got to get at young people a hell of a lot earlier? We're leaving it too late, surely, aren't we? Once they're at secondary school. I, I, I agree, I and mean, I think I think it, it's. I mean, people make up their their minds about careers at different points in their lives, and and uh, and inevitably kind of change direction at several different points. Um, so yes, absolutely. I, I think you know we, we do need to kind of get that that, um, that excitement, that um, engagement as, a, as an early an, an age as possible. I know STEM Works and others are in the room. Uh, that sort of work where you're kind of going in early and, and working on projects with, with schools at, at an early stage. I think that the flips aren't very, and, and, and this is this is actually you know very important. Is that I think. Um, you know, the focus um, definitely does need to be with, with the schools and, and the colleges, but it also needs to be about the retraining and the upskilling in the workforce. Um, because certainly some of, some of the work that, that Catherine and I have been, and been doing is really looking at kind of replacement demand in the, the Gloucestershire economy. Um, and it's uh, kind of nine to one in terms of the demand for replacement jobs as opposed to kind of new jobs coming through the school system effectively. Um, so, you know, the focus does need to be on that. So one of the things that, that we've been doing through, through the, the LEP and, and the County Council is, is to actually uh, have that investment in, in upskilling um, people, uh, both on a STEM project, um, which is in addition to the, the ones that Mel was mentioning earlier, uh, and the Skills for Low Carbon project. So, you know, be between those two projects, there's nearly three million pounds worth of funding. Double that up because it's match funded. You know, so six million coming into, into the county to do that. And it's dead easy to kind of forget that that you know that's for me that's the, the kind of the big bit of the iceberg. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, Lucy, by my side, is senior uh, senior development engineer at Renishaw. I first met Lucy about um, eight years ago. I think when she started at Renishaw at sixteen, um, she went to the King's School, you know, private school in Gloucester didn't want to go to university, went to an engineering weekend, the light bulb went on, I think, then, and uh, she's come today with four of her colleagues from Renishaw, and I know we talk about Renishaw a lot, and I certainly do, but this is a company born out of apprenticeships. The owners were apprentices. It's an amazing, world-leading world -leading edge company. And they've got something like, I think, Lucy, 40 women engineers in training at the moment, which is absolutely brilliant from something like 19 to 23. So Lucy is just going to talk about her journey, and then we're going to have some questions. So Lucy. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, uh, as um, Ian said, I went to school in Gloucester, and I was always destined to do quite well and go on to a good university, but on the run-up to my GCSEs, I'd already decided that engineering was for me on this one work experience weekend, and I, I decided I wanted to get started sooner. So I started looking around at uh, Gloucestershire College um, and what courses they had, but whilst doing that, I found an advert for the Renishaw Apprenticeship. I'd not known anyone that had done an apprenticeship, and I didn't know much about it. So I uh, did some research, and the fact that you could earn whilst learning and have all your college fees paid for um, made me wonder why more people didn't do it. So uh, I got really excited, went back into my school and told them all about it, and they were horrified. <laughs> uh, they did not understand why someone who was as bright as me would want to leave school and do an apprenticeship. And that just kind of tells you something about you know, the, the generation that my teachers were, but also the, the stereotype of uh, apprenticeships. Um, luckily for me, at that time of my life, I was quite um, 
strong-minded. Uh, that's probably putting it politely. So, uh, yeah, so I decided to just go and do it. So them telling me not to made me just want to do it more. So I applied and I started at 16. Uh, I did my, completed my apprenticeship and went on to gain a first class honours degree in mechanical and manufacturing engineering. Um, and I won the Women's Engineering Society Prize at the Young Women Engineering of the Year Award. So um, I go out and tell my story because I love my job. I love my career. Uh, it's, it's such a fantastic option for me. Um, and I want to prove to people that apprenticeships are the way forward. And um, how are we going to sort this issue of women in engineering? How are we going to persuade women like the ladies here? And can you just name check them? Yeah. Uh, so today I've brought with me Lucy, Rosie, Sarah, and Karen. Uh, they're all starting their journey of, of, of being STEM ambassadors. Um, we're really trying to promote STEM ambassadors at Renishaw. We've found it particularly useful for young women um, because uh, girls at school very much relate to other people and other people's stories rather than things and facts. So the idea is that we're training up a number of our STEM ambassadors uh, to go out and tell their story because these girls have all taken different routes. They've done apprenticeships, graduate opportunities, Karen went and teach d &T for uh, four years before she ended up coming into Renishaw. So um, it's talking about those things, knowing to, for the girls to know that it's okay to change your mind, to go slightly off piece, you don't have to know exactly at each point what you're doing. So we're training up our summer ambassadors to go out there because like I said, for young women, it's so important that they can relate to someone and they can have those role models ahead of them. And the younger they are, the more relatable they are, the more human they are, the better. Um, and that's what we're doing. So we've got over 100 STEM ambassadors now, um, and a good majority of them are women, doing events every single week. Um, and like we said earlier, the younger we can get into schools, the better. The more hands-on the activities, the better as well. This is the thing that really infuses people about maths and science. Um, any of your colleagues, any thoughts on that, ladies? Anyone want to say anything? <laughs> Only because I come from a teaching background and I used to teach science technology. Definitely the younger you can get in, the better. Girls are really interested, really, really interested. And as they get older and the boys get older, you start to see a bit of a divide between male and female. And it, and it starts to put them off. And, and it's really hard to get around that because they want to be with their friends and then they might not want to be with the boys either because of the differences. So the earlier you can get in, they're, they're still really eager and they still really want to do it. And Lucy is uh, doing an amazing job in America. She's now a, a global ambassador working in America, uh, partnering colleges for Renishaw. And you've just put your first house, which yeah. is fantastic at 29. So, you know, you're earning the money as well. I think, you know, this is a great example, the ladies here as well, of, of what Ken has been talking about. You know, absolutely amazing. Um, right, that's sort of enough of me. Let, let's have some questions to anyone. Uh, any particular questions, particularly interested in any SMEs here, what sort of thoughts they have about um, young people coming to them and are they, do they have the communication skills, the presence that you really need? Uh, yes, sir. Who, who, who um, Dave, 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 Dave Cook from Arc Energy Resources in Eastington. And what do you do, Dave? What do we're, you do? Uh, we're welding engineers, so we're very interested in Right, so you'd be very interested in this. Absolutely, situation. really interesting. We're seeing what's going on with the uh, Magnus and Cavendish and advanced manufacturing. I just think more on a on a wider scale, you're up against some serious competition down at uh, Bridgewater for trying to get these people involved, the young people focused on coming into engineering. You mean the EDF? Yeah. Well, no, I'm just thinking about the, the technical college, the college, college that's going yeah. on there. So you're going after the same sort of catchment area, and they have a defined goal, if you like, as a project down there. Now, it may well be there's a there's a problem on here, but what I, it was it's unfortunate that the uh, the MP the MP just sort of disappears. We're going to sort of push him on this. I think industry really needs to have the support. It starts with central government giving us an idea on 
the policies going forwards on, on, on major projects that are going through. We've seen, you know, you've got, you've got the Cardiff Bay tidal uh, lagoon. These kind of things are important for young people to understand what their goal is going to be, what they can focus on. Now, if they've got something like that, that surely is going to be um, give them the ambition to get into engineering. So it, it needs to stem from there to have that. Then schools can say, look, there's a definite path here. You know, they can hold on to something. But until the government of the day, whoever that is going to be, is going to turn around and stop messing around with green papers and come up with a defined actual you know policy going through whether it's nuclear whether it's small modular reactors whether it's a mixture of green energy whatever it is let's be definite about it let's let's give the country and the young people something to hang on to and then they can go for it and would you be prepared to become a partner for you absolutely without that that's that's fantastic fantastic anyone else Can I just, uh, before we uh, uh, leave this, I think it's important to have a uh, uh, the event. We're working very closely with Bridgewater, and um, they are some way in front of the curve, and Gloucester are behind. Yeah, I mean, what we're trying to do is is um, uh, catch up. Um, several things that uh, you said that I absolutely agree with. Um, one of the problems we've got at the moment um, is that um, uh, irrespective of nuclear, whether Aubrey takes off or, uh, or not, um, we've got a, a, um, a declining population, we've got uh, businesses that will need to uh, succession plan. Large businesses, the Renshaw's only fine, they, you know, they can attract uh, good talent, they can, um, uh, they can have their um, uh, apprenticeship programmes. The vast majority of businesses nationally, RSMEs, don't necessarily have that luxury. So what we can have one or two uh, ways. We can go back to the old days where it's just a case of well, when you've um, lost um, Joe or Jenny, uh, the, um, uh, the the chief engineer, you just go and pinch somebody else's, you, you know, because that's what's happening at the at the moment. And then your, your costs rise, and, and uh, uh, you're having your problems. Or we can um, uh, go back to the sporting analogy again. You can decide as a business that you go and buy talent. When you need centre forward, you go and buy one. You don't have a, a, a friendship scheme, you don't have a, 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 an academy. What you'll do is just get what you need when you need it. And it's a perfectly sensible, logical um, uh, um, uh, policy. What you've got here, though, uh, within Gloucestershire, is that uh, the academy, if you like, where we'll have, with the UTC and uh, what's happening here, um, up to something like 800 young people that want to be employed in engineering, manufacturing, or cyber. Now, you don't know, taking the sports analogy to the extreme here, whether you want a centre forward or a right back or a goalkeeper. You won't know in five years' time because your business uh, can go any way, um, uh, you know, it can boom, it, you can start retracting, uh, etc. But what you've got here, if you engage with this side, is the ability to look at 600 individuals all different skill sets, all different types of people, and you'd be able to, if you um, tie, uh, tie in with us, to track somebody through. And then when you have a vacancy, it's far easier to go somewhere where you know that uh, you've had some input in what they're doing and how they're doing it. You, you've seen that uh, individual grow, and you make decision at 16 or 18 to, uh, to employ. So we are creating something that um, isn't uh, available in um, uh, um, uh, Gloucester at the moment. And, um, and it all depends, and it falls or is successful based on how the employers engage and how you um, tell us the industry is going. So welding, uh, the welding facilities down there, we need um, some about 250,000 pounds from Magnox to upgrade that and we can um, deliver welding to Delta Standard in those facilities. Delta Standard, for those that may not know, that's the standard you require to weld or to do anything at a nuclear power station. There isn't a, um, a qualification in the country yet for Delta Standard uh, in most of these areas. So Bridgewater are helping design it and we'll be adopting that, uh, that process as it goes on. Yeah. Peter, you want to say something? Just, just again, just in response to you, your question, I, I think you're absolutely right in terms of the, you know, the kind of national picture on that. Until, until that 
is settled, and obviously the hope is that the industrial strategy will, you know, will settle down and that there'll be a kind of clear focus. Obviously, if there's a change in government, then you know that that could, could be back to the drawing board. But we'll, we'll wait and see on that one. Um, I mean, I think what we can do locally, though, is, is actually do uh, kind of an equivalent to that, which is to actually say, you know, what, what is happening in the kind of future uh, in the county and what do we want to happen in the, in the county in the future, uh, particularly around kind of infrastructure planning to, to then enable that message to kind of go out. So two, two kind of live examples. One is obviously the, the LEP has actually invested um, uh, sort of 20 million pounds or thereabouts into, into developing a cyber park next to GCHQ. Um, that, that is going to be a phenomenal opportunity for, for kind of inward investment in terms of you know, cyber protection and, and, uh, and also the expansion of, of, the, uh, of GCHQ because obviously they're bulging at the seams in terms of staff at the moment. Um, so, that, you know, that, and that's kind of got a particular timeline to it. Um, so, that enables, I think, people to, to plan locally. But for the you know the education training providers to actually see you know this, this is a, a kind of a key opportunity for for uh, employment within the county um, and you know there's going to be there's already some work with you know accelerating some of those businesses that are working there it's having that you know that sort of forward thinking type you know, kind of timeline that's then available um, in schools and colleges as well to help them to start you know to see what's coming down the track can, can I just add, add on to that when you go around the country, you have certain areas, clusters that are well known, and you get on the head cyber and GCHQ, that kind of goes hand in glove. That's fine. Not great for us engineers out there who wait for other people to come out. But I think I think that is, you know, you've got to play to your strengths. But when you, you look at other areas like Cumbria, they, they, they rename themselves, rebadge themselves the Energy Coast. You go down to Oxford, it's the cryogenic cluster. What's Gloucester apart from maybe cyber? But, you know, so. You've got an opportunity here, we, as a, you know, as, a, as a community, have the opportunity to turn around and say, well, you've got Hinkley, you've got that, okay, we are still 40, 50 miles away from, 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 the, from HPC, but as you say, there are other developments going on. Maybe we need to think about giving ourselves a definite identity about engineering, or you know, whether it's nuclear, whether it's tidal, I don't know, but somewhere along the line. It's, it's a it's a very interesting point. I think I think you're absolutely right, and it's something um, you know, Robin and I were working on the on the bid to to, uh, to government in terms of you know, trying to bring the money in for this for this project and others. Um, and and, it, and it's kind of what is that USP for Gloucestershire? Uh, and it, it has been quite quite difficult to define because in one sense, you know, from, from economic terms and from kind of European funding terms, we're not bad enough in inverted commas. Um, and, but, and we've got lots of real strengths in the county, but it's not around one thing in particular. So, yeah, absolutely, I, I agree. It's still a, an ongoing, an ongoing discussion. Yeah, doesn't it make you uh, really sort of upset when you hear about the Midland Engine and the Northern Powerhouse and looking at the whole Southwest? What we're talking about today seems to me to be at the heart of it. You know, aerospace engineering high tech and we failed to do this so far and I think you're right we need to actually sort that out I know there's some ideas about having something called the great southwest not the greatest in line in my view but uh, I think that's a good good point uh, any any other last last question sir sorry Matt no I'm sorry all right lady Fussman Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, you did. Sorry, no. sorry. Uh, sorry. Catherine Beckler from Dalton oh, yeah. Diesel Systems. Yeah. Good morning. Um, I think I'm picking up on some of the strands. What said. You seem to be very good at dealing with the younger age group. Primary schools are engaged. A lot more girls, definitely, at the primary school point of it. Um, and with the UTC trying to now, I think there's still a gap at that sort of first years of secondary school where we, we seem to have lost any engagement and I think that's twofold. I think that's partly because schools are so tied into batching up to the national curriculum and Ofsted and ticking all the boxes that they struggle to do anything outside of it. And the other side of it is there's no investment in design and technology. Some of the schools have now dropped it completely because they don't have the funding to keep up with technology. My question, I guess, more to sort of Peter and Rowan is, what are we doing as a county to address that gap where I think the girls fall away? 
Um, it's, yeah, I'm going to go to Skyler. I, I, I mean, I think, um, I, I think you're right. I think there are, you know, sort of concerns of, about that, about people making choices. For me, it's, um, uh, and it's, like, it's a shame Neil's not, not here on this one. I mean, I've, I've, like you, um, you know, it is a very squeezed curriculum for, for the schools. Um, and for me, it keeps coming back to well, what are schools measured on? Well, they're not actually measured on, on kind of engagement with businesses and, and kind of preparing people for, uh, for, for a future world of work. What they're measured on is, is exam results. And um, yes, there is a kind of a destination measure there, but it's, it's far too general. Um, so part of it for me goes, you know, is, is about government policy. Clearly, we can keep lobbying about that. Um, uh, but you know, I think on a local level, it is it is just trying to, to kind of influence. And this is you know, this, I know you do a lot of work on, on this with, with the schools. Um, but it, it's continually kind of saying what you know what can what else can we do? Given that we can't necessarily change policy overnight, you know, what what is it that other what what PS schools are doing and that's working that, that then other schools get interested in because they've got very engaged students and it you know gets that sort of virtuous circle. I think, I think in terms of your point about, um, about investment, uh, absolutely, totally agree. Um, you know, again, we haven't, um, because we, we haven't historically been able to influence the school's budgets in that way, um, what, what the, the, the County Council has been doing is, is actually working on the, uh, uh, the kind of college budgets um, uh, in terms of skills investment. So what we've done is, is kind of get money for STEM development. So, Obviously, the, the kind of the five million into this, this build and all this kind of particular bit of the, the, the site, uh, and then the, uh, there's a, a further kind of just over two point one million that, that's gone into three of the other colleges in, in the county, and that's to get kind of cutting edge, uh, industry standard equipment and facilities. So I run a school, and it's the uh, it's had the um, uh, uh, infamous title of probably the worst school in performance terms in the county. Uh, when we asked to take it over. So I know firsthand what schools, <coughs> and it opened my eyes because I used to run in a college and uh, you know, um, uh, schools, um, and you know, I've, I've said this to uh, Neil on more than one occasion, uh, there is real term cuts to budgets in schools. So anything that you've got now with a narrow curriculum is going to get even narrower. Okay, so we're not going to have rounded um, uh, young people coming out of schools. We'll have young people that have been um, uh, um, pushed into a choice of 10 or 11 subject areas. Science is no problem, that will not always be there. Maths, no problem be there. The, um, the technology and the, um, uh, which is uh, in school terms is IT uh, and DT, um, those two will be um, shrunk down to next to nothing. Okay. And um, so we are going to have an almighty crash in um, uh, three or four years' time because um, you can do one of these things at a time, but um, we've got a perfect storm. We've got a um, declining uh, funding into education. Let's say um, right through from um, uh, infant reception, uh, right the way through to uh, um, uh, post 16. At the same time, we're changing the um, uh, the qualifications, and we're changing the way in which qualifications are graded. That's a learning curve for everybody, and we are um, saying you've got to also improve. Now, I don't know about your businesses, but if you reduce your um, uh, your uh, surpluses, then it will probably mean that. Um, being uh, even better next year isn't something that you can uh, really commit to because you'll be fo focused on re um, uh, rebasing everything and you can't do it all at once. So 22 out of 100 uh, 14 year olds that applied for the UTC are girls. And I think that's phenomenal, bearing in mind the, the salt base because they haven't yet been clouded. They haven't been put off yet. They, um, and I've got a daughter, very interested in IT, and um, if it wasn't for the fact that we inherited from kinetics, saying, well, you know, come to our days, and this is where businesses can work. 
you know, great to see um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 girls and um, young women uh, coming in. Girls need to see other girls in these, in these areas. Okay, so that, I'm absolutely confident that 50% of the population coming to the technology and to the, um, to the engineering side um, is, uh, you know, we've missed out on all that um, uh, energy, all that enthusiasm and all that expertise because we, we've had a, a bit of a close shop. So in one way, I've got problems because the curriculum's going to be narrowed and, and technology and engineering is going to be um, a secondary thought. But there's also an opportunity of um, a, a, a vocational offer at 14. And what makes that different? And it, I'm not selling it because it's nothing to do with the college, it's a separate organisation. It's, it's, if you like, in competition with the college. But what makes that different is that you have the national curriculum, so these narrow subjects because there's nothing there, but 40% um, of what you do after then is project based. So it's get your hands dirty, make the mistakes. You know, and when I looked at the Edge project and the, uh, the question is, this is why it's so important that if you're not completing the question, do so. There's lots of um, uh, uh, attributes you're looking for that don't require talent. You know, be resilient, turn up on time, dress appropriately, answer the telephone, be, um, work as part of a team, don't require talent. But, we don't, we, um, so, uh, but what we need to do is design the whole child. What I'm concerned about with schools and now curriculum is they're just a, a qualifications factory, they're not going to get the round person, and we're going to um, uh, create, in three or four years' time, a workforce that's not ready to work. Uh, for work. We're ready for university. And that, that's where we want. Yeah. Catherine, uh, for those you who don't know, is Delphi, and Delphi are uh, an amazing <laughs> apprenticeship. <laughs> Uh, encourager, I would say, and supporter. Yeah. And uh, we've got a lot of confidence for that. Uh, gentleman had his hand up. I've got something to say, yes. Um, I actually work in DT. Um, I work in a secondary school. I'm here on my day off for exactly the What's current. your name, sir, in your school? I'm Ace Brewer Wolf. I work for Flamersville Secondary School. Right. Um, <clears throat> there is a huge gap between where I stand with children and their future employment. Um, I try and see my role, not just as teaching, but also to inspire people to come into engineering. Because I understand about employment opportunities in engineering in this county and in South Gloucestershire where I live. My daughter's come to this school in September because I believe that's the career that she wants to go for. And she's been inspired by what I do for a living. So it's very, very important that we have good links between business and secondary school. STEM in my school, there's a proposed cut in budget of 50%. We can't sustain a DET environment with a 50% cut in budget. It's only nine grand a year as it is. So I have to become extremely creative in the projects and materials that we can offer the children. So I've now become Scrap Store's number one customer. <laughs> um, and I'm like, spending my time looking for ways to um, enhance our existing curriculum and reduce the budget. So. If you look at my face and you've got anything you can help us with, um, I'm, I'm part of a large group uh, called CSET and I will be looking for second hand equipment or new if you want to sponsor some um, to try and maintain the level of DT that we have in our school and actually improve it. You know, bringing women into uh, engineering is something I'm extremely passionate about because I have a daughter and it is um, it's something that uh, has been a male uh, provision for a long, long time. But I'm looking backwards at the 1950s engineers where I came from, and I'm now looking at the future of engineering for this country and our area in particular, and those are the people that I'm setting up for that future. So, you know, it's, it's us that you need to support me. I take your point about education. Um, I do take your point about younger education too, but to be honest, we still haven't really cracked it at secondary school. There's a huge gap between uh, what we teach every day and what's required by the people I'm sat with today. So that's part of my job. I'm here voluntarily <coughs> doing this to try and understand what difference I can make and inspire young people to be to do it. Thank you. Thank you. And just to sum up from your point of view. Um, well, let's just finish on that point on uh, upskilling. The um, uh, larger businesses are now paying a levy. And, um, uh, 
The government has a, um, a target of three million people that are going to be apprentices. I don't know whether this is a problem or it's um, a, a, a just the way it is, but um, only 25% of those 3 million will be 16 to 18. 75% will be over 19 that are going to have an apprenticeship. Um, to date, about 2% or over 60 that are undertaking an apprenticeship. Um, there are 44% that are over uh, 24 and about 24% over 35. So I think one of the things that um, businesses are doing is um, some of the larger businesses are paying the money to say, look, now I'm putting 0.5% um, percent of my uh, payroll into a loading. I can't touch that unless I, I upskill and I uh, train. And then I think it's a, a mixture of both. You, um, of course, what you, um, if you're in a larger business, you're able to talents um, uh, identify and put on, uh, people on pathways, and uh, if there's some money for, for training as well, uh, then uh, you have access. But, uh, so I don't think it's a one uh, answer solution. I think what the, my job is, is to recognize that 19% um, of all jobs, just 19% are construction, manufacturing, or uh, agri agriculture and energy, 19%. So what, as a college, I've got to cope with the 19% that are really saying, look, the very powerful voices saying, look, we've got to have more engineers and um, we've got more cyber people. Um, but I know that as, a, um, as an economy, 80% are not in those areas. You know, they're retail, they're, um, uh, they are education, health. And so as a, as a um, college, what we're trying to do is respond to a whole raft of demand for um, a you know, career. So if somebody comes to me and they say, I want to be a nurse, I don't, my job isn't to say, well, really, I've talked to somebody, really an engineer, they want to be an engineer. You know, and so uh, this point about going to schools and giving a range, I think the, the biggest, and because we haven't got that, young people just don't know what to do, parents don't know what to do, it's very confusing. And so what they do sometimes is just go with what the schools told them, that is do uh, GCSEs and A-levels. I go to, a, uh, to my daughter's school, sit down, and they're, they're telling my daughter about their A-levels in the sixth form next year. That's it. That's the career guidance. And I'm sitting there thinking, I, I bet you won't ask me what I do for a living. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and so and that's your problem. And so uh, I think careers education have absolutely got it um, and uh, the ambassadors, everything that you do as an employer, everything you um, can do to help schools, go in schools and, and present yourself and present your company, you raise that demand. And when somebody comes to me and says, I want to be an engineer, I've got half a, a chance of saying, well, I've got a course for you. Thanks. Um, yeah, just about careers education. I, I went to a London conference in school, left at 16, went to a, a ledge career session. My mum said, oh, he wants to be a reporter. I said, no chance, you'll never get that. Um, I did an apprenticeship, uh, went to uh, night school. I was the only lad there, uh, much to the uh, laughter of all the women, did shorthand. At 22 years old, I was asked to join the Daily Mail. You could say I've tumbled since then. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is, this is really important. I'd just like to sort of end by reading you something very short from uh, the Sunday Times Business News on Sunday by Ian Day. He says, Britain lacks key skills. The shortage of graduates in engineering and science subjects is being made all the more acute by the clampdown on immigration which is already dissuading talent from coming to these shores, as any employer of PhDs will attest. Why not scrap university tuition fees for the core STEM subjects? Not a bad idea. But the government believes are crucial for our survival in the digital age. It is the job of government to allocate resources to where they are needed. A financial incentive to drive more youngsters to the industries the country needs 
could transform our position in the world. This type of thing works. Many of those post-war American computing pioneers were plucked out of school and put through fast-track degree courses, paid for by the military. Conscription might be a step too far, but a free education, if you pick the right subject, could be a helpful nudge. And I just say this to Peter, uh, when the next government is elected in a week's time, we need a proper business and industrial strategy that has skills, apprenticeships at its core. And uh, what I've been pleased about this morning is to be here in a, an organisation, and I speak as a Vice President of Gloucestershire College. I'm jealous of <laughs> what Kevin has, has sorted here. This is.